92.3 FM, WMXD. The salute to the temptations. A special tribute to Mr. David Ruffin, who tragically passed away earlier today. Like uh, thousands of other Detroiters who were shocked and saddened Many made their way to the Motown Museum, where it all started for Mr. David Ruffin. When I went there today, uh, TV camera crews were there. People were just stopping by the Motown Museum right off of uh, Grand Boulevard. As if it were uh, a shrine, which it is very much a shrine, to all of the Motown stars and to all of the things that Motown meant to the world. Uh, these artifacts are embodied there at the Motown Museum. The founder of the Motown Museum, Mrs. Esther Edwards, was there. She was nice enough to talk to me, spent a few hours talking to me about the temptations, about David Ruffin when he first joined the Motown stable and how he got there. And I asked her if she could uh, talk with me later on tonight. And she graciously accepted. And we have her on the line right now. Uh, hello, Mrs. Edwards. Hello, Mojo. All right, how are you today? Well, I'm just fine considering the uh, sadness that we have for, you know, uh, hearing about the death of David Ruffin. But everything is fine otherwise. Uh, David Ruffin came up to Detroit from Meridian, Mississippi, is that correct? Right? Yes, that's right. Uh, how did he get to Motown? Well, actually, you know, when uh, uh, I, I think I, I was talking with my sister Gwendolyn Gordy Fuqua, and, um, you know, Gwendolyn uh, owned Anna Records, and it seems that a, a friend uh, of David's brought him to Detroit, and brought him over to Anna Records, and um, because there was a flat over her company on Saint Antoine and Farnsworth, uh, David stayed there, and uh, Gwen signed David to a recording contract, and he had a couple of records on Anna, and then subsequently uh, um, she uh, steered David over to uh, Motown to Barry's uh, company. Uh, Motown Records. What kind of guy was David Ruffin? Well, David, um, in those days, I, I, I knew David. He was uh, quiet-spoken and, you know, just a, a nice person and uh, very talented always. And uh, when he joined The Temptations, uh, he fit the group perfectly. Uh, you know, the guys were handsome and and uh, very uh, much together and uh, just a kind of a unified uh, group and uh, David fitted in just fine and the first um, hit recording that uh, the Temptations had uh, David Ruffin was a part of that 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 uh, group at, you know and I think it was about 1963 when David joined the Temps and their first um, major, their first hit was The Way You Do the Things You Do. Of course, Eddie Kendricks was leading it, but um, it was David and Melvin and Otis and, um, and Eddie. We were talking earlier about how they got along as a group. Uh, you had mentioned that and they... Paul Williams, I'm sorry, I left Paul out. Mm-hmm. You were mentioning how they got along as a group how uh, they uh, always tried to look out for each other and they very much acted uh, like an organization yes that's correct yes they monitored each other's uh, activities and they had their own ground rules and their um, codes you know of ethics and uh, they just um, you know they they uh, they had uh, they find each other for being late or different things. They they really um, was a together group, and uh, 
they wanted to look good and they wanted to uh, be the best. And they worked hard and they practiced hard and they were not overnight successes. Um, it, it took um, about four years. Um, uh, David was not one of the original members, but uh, uh, he joined the group in 63. And of course they had not uh, had any hits uh, up until that, that time. And after, after the way you do the things you do, um, the Temps never looked back, and they were just a, a group that was an idol uh, to many, many young men across this country, and even in foreign countries. They had their style, and they had their uh, synchronization, and um, they were just great to look at. David was was a real lead singer uh in fact several uh, so many of the temps and were or could sing the lead and uh, they they were they were unique they were different and they were they were just um exciting wonderful <laughs> uh, group and they still are today really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're speaking with mrs esther edwards uh the sister barry gordy and the founder of the Motown Museum. What would you say, what did David Ruffin uh, bring to the group that uh, wasn't already there, or maybe it was there, and maybe his presence uh, brought it out even more? Well, I think David, um, on stage, um, David brought probably some additional excitement and a different kind of excitement, you know, uh, the temp said, you know, great voices and great harmony, and um, uh, and uh, they they were good dancers. Uh, Paul Williams, uh, I think, was like their choreographer, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, and they would come up with these steps, and of course, in in the Motown Artist Personal Development Department, Charlie Atkins. Uh, uh, help them to synchronize those steps, but they could really dance, they could do the temptation walk, but David added, I think, m some more excitement to the dance and uh, did some little extra things. Uh, off stage, I knew David uh, is kind of quiet spoken and not having a great deal to say um, in those early days he was a member of the temptations from 1963 to about 1968 when he uh, uh, still stayed at motown but it, it, he was became a solo act um until about um um 79 i believe it was mm -hmm. And that, that's when he went to Atlantic Records. But he rejoined the Temps in 1982 for this reunion LP, which is a, which is a classic LP. It certainly is. Mm -hmm. um, as the founder of the Motown Museum, uh, at, at a moment like this with the loss of uh, such an incredibly talented entertainer, such as David Ruffin, um, I would be remiss not to say that uh, the world is is indebted uh, to you because uh, you have single-handedly taken on the project of uh, of putting a museum together, uh, enshrining all of the uh, the artifacts and the things that uh, made uh, Motown Records happen, and. Uh, the, I, I was in there and I saw uh, the original uniform that this group wore on stage. I guess they must have worn it during one of the uh, Motown reviews. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, when you first started putting this together, how did that come about, putting a museum together? Well, I want to say that, that I haven't quite done it single-handedly because uh, there's some wonderful volunteers that... Uh, 
help out in the museum. I couldn't do it otherwise. And uh, and we have a, a few uh, very dedicated staff members. But the idea, the museum just kind of started evolving around me when the Motown headquarters moved out to California and the uh, and, they, and we moved from the building downtown on Woodward Avenue, then the Hitsville USA house uh, that had the recording studio had been uh, operable and, and the recording sessions were still going on 24 hours a day from 1959 to 1972. That house, Hitsville USA at 2648 West Grand Boulevard there, little west of Henry Ford Hospital, um, became the Detroit branch office in 1972 when the headquarters moved to Hollywood, California. And I became the, the uh, uh, I was senior vice president of the company, and uh, so I stayed there and to oversee the Detroit uh, operation. And people would just show up on the doorstep. They would come from mostly from the foreign countries. And uh, one day I looked out and it was like the whole British Navy was out there, all these, all these young men in white and with this accent. And they had just docked in Toledo and took a bus to come over to see where it all began. Where did Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, uh, Marvin Guy, they called him. Uh, where they started and they were just amazed and it was just uh, and they treated it like it was a shrine as did so many, so many other visitors mostly foreign visitors and it was at that point I began to realize that hey maybe Motown made history maybe Detroit was um, had you know something else to be very proud of and uh, so as I said, it just started evolving, and that gave me the idea, well, maybe we should uh, display some of the uh, artifacts and some of the gold records and some of the wards and some of the photos so that if these people are going to uh, hop the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean to come to Detroit just to see us, as many of them said, then maybe we should have something for them to, to look at. And so that's how the museum started evolving. And uh, because we were not a corporate project, we formed the Motown Museum Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, to try to make this museum happen so that we could um, uh, preserve the, the uh, history, this era in American music history that had such a global impact and it started right here in Detroit uh, by just a, uh, a young black man who really didn't set out to build a Motown, but Barry Gordy just did not wish to work on the production line in the factory um, as, as a career and uh, he didn't like the routine job and so he just quit that job and it was a good $85 a week job in the, in those days and um, he just quit it to uh, said he was going to be a songwriter and had no intentions of um, of uh, he had uh, well he had almost given up his dream of um, you know uh, being um, you know being Making a million dollars, but he always, uh, when mm -hmm. he was young, he always said he wanted right. to be uh, a, pro a, a boxer because he'd hear about these million dollar gates and things like that, you see. So uh, he just thought he'd be a songwriter and, and he didn't know that that was a great deal of money or anything like that. And uh, one thing led to another and that's the way Motown got started and it seems that the museum is kind of parallel to that. It just started evolving and now the ball has begun to roll and we have great plans because we really would like to preserve this history because we wanted to uh, inspire and motivate and educate 
especially young people to know that you know you what can happen if you uh, just pursue your dream and with uh, a unity and togetherness and love and support for each other and keeping plan mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, you know that's the way that's it got started. what's happening at the museum and we certainly appreciate every every bit of help that we can get and uh, as I said not I can't do it single-handedly, and I haven't. Uh, but with the help of the, the the people of Detroit, I'm sure that we can build a world-class museum that uh, we will all be proud of. Well, what are the hours of operation? Uh, Monday through Friday, um, from nine until from ten until five. Monday through Friday, and on Sundays from two to five. And, of course, we're closed on holidays. Right. And um, uh, there's a $3 admission, $2 for children under 12. And uh, we have a souvenir shop, and uh, that is what supports the museum at this point. It, it would be great to see... Uh, it would be great to see uh, all of the dreams and hopes that you have for the museum... Uh, you know, come to pass, because I think that, um, you know, events like this, uh, you know, though tragic, very tragic. Yeah, it's it, very sad and very, we're very sorry because David was a young man and so talented, you know, such a, a one-of-a-kind entertainer with his own style and uh, just so unfortunate, uh, you know, that... Um, the the um, the the um, problems of today, uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the drugs and so forth. It's it's just too bad. It's just really saddening that uh, young people have to be exposed to to that kind of a possibility. Well, the. It, with the museum, uh, at least uh, all of the David Ruffin fans uh, tomorrow, Temptations fans, they can uh, walk in the footsteps of giants because of your efforts to preserve, uh, you know, this great facility. Um, earlier today, I saw the uniforms that the Temptations wore on stage, the very shoes that they danced in, and um, I think it's a... Uh, it's pretty incredible to have a facility that uh, these great memories of the past have been enshrined in. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the world owes you a standing ovation for making sure that these things were preserved and are still being preserved. Well, thank you, Mojo. Thank you very much. And I'll see you tomorrow at the museum. All right. I'll, I'll certainly look forward to you uh, seeing you tomorrow. Ms. And thanks a million. And thank you very much for your time. All right. This is WMXD. We've been speaking with Mrs. Esther Edwards, uh, the sister of Barry Gordy, the founder of the Motown Museum, uh, sharing some memories on Mr. David Ruffin. You're listening to the tribute to Mr. David Ruffin and the Temptations. In just a few minutes, we'll be talking with Ms. Gwen Gordy Fuqua. When David Ruffin came from Meridian, Mississippi, uh, the first label he signed with was Anna Records. And we'll be talking with uh, Ms. Fuqua in just a few seconds. On 92.3 FM and the continuing tribute to Mr. David Ruffin. 92.3 FM, Electrify Mojo. And our continuing tribute to Mr. David Ruffin on the line right now. It's Ms. Gwen Gordy Fuqua. Who on Anna Records and at that time was introduced to Mr. David Ruffin. Hello, Ms. Fuqua. Hello. How are you tonight? Oh, a little sad and, and a little shocked. How are you? I'm doing fine. And about the same situation, I guess uh, the whole city of Detroit right now and perhaps the world is in shock because uh, uh, David Ruffin was definitely uh, a very respected entertainer, uh, 
of course, you saw all of that a long time ago, uh, long before the world saw it, and you were very instrumental in bringing the talents of uh, David Ruffin to the world. Uh, when he was first introduced to you um, and brought up from Meridian, Mississippi, uh, uh, let's talk about that. I first... love David very much. Uh, a friend of his named Eddie, I don't remember his last name at this particular time, but he brought David to me. At the time, I had Anna Records. And he said that, hey, I, I brought this boy from Mississippi. He says, but I don't have any place to keep him, and I don't know exactly what to do with him. He says, but I brought him to you. He said, because I heard a lot of nice things about you. He says, I met you a time or two. He says, you probably don't remember me. He says, but, um, you know, I want you to hear him. So he says, but the only thing about it, he says, I don't have a place for him to live. So I said, well, okay, we'll hear him. So, of course, I heard David, and I thought he was really a superstar. And he really was, I mean, he's so energetic. He was young, and he really wanted to be in the entertainment business. And he was, seemed like a very nice person. So, of course, over Anna Records, my dad owned a building there on Farnsworth and St. Antoine. We had two, two family flats. So, so then David, as a lot of the other artists, stayed there. And, of course, I signed him to management. And um, then we just rehearsed. We did a lot of rehearsing. But he, every rehearsal that he had was just like a performance on the stage. And I thought he was going to be a super talent, which he turned out to be. Okay, and from Anna Records, he went to uh, Motown Records. Yes, he went to my brother Barry, as most of the artists from Anna Records, because Barry and them were on the big move, and uh, they left, came from Anna Records and went to Barry. When David was uh, first introduced to you, and you were basically uh, taking a look at uh, other talent that was also being introduced to you at the time, um, what 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 was it about him just said, okay, well, this one I think we should sign, and how does it feel when you make those type of decisions and you have it turn out to be so overwhelmingly right? When uh, David was first introduced to you, uh, as was a lot of other entertainers, uh, what was it about him that said, yep, that one is going to be one of the big ones? Well, because he was really into it. He wanted to be a superstar. He wanted to be the best. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, you people that have a great or a good voice, uh, they just perform and they do. But he always was one of the ones that overdid. You know, in rehearsals, he was just uh, like he wanted to. He would. He wanted to be the. You know, he wanted to be the. He would uh, rehearse everything that you saw him do on stage almost was the way he rehearsed and of course we had uh, we did a little grooming and we did a little a lot of things with him but he had it in him he wanted to be there and he worked very hard and there was never a time that he could rehearse for eight hours if that's what it's called for mm -hmm. you know he was just he was just there and he just was there for you and he wanted to be there and he wanted to be with in front of the pub he loved people he loved people he was just a great personality and a great fellow we're speaking live with miss miss fuqua squin fuqua in california and uh she's in california right now and she uh was nice enough to talk to us on the phone and that we're doing the uh david ruffin uh tribute uh one one last question the steps uh, that David and the Temptations were doing, uh, how did those steps come about? Did he bring that energy to the group? Well, he was energetic. His steps were not especially those steps. Uh, Barry had a thing when he was with the Temptations. Barry had a department, which I headed up, with Harvey Fuqua, Charlie Atkins, and Maxine Powell. I headed up the department. And, of course, they got their choreography from Charlie Atkins. They got a lot of the things from Harvey. And it was just all about everybody that was in that department. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Fuqua, for uh, spending this time talking to us live uh, in California uh, on this uh, David uh, Ruffin tribute. And uh, we wish you uh, continued success. And once again, thank you for sharing the microphone with us. All right. Thank you, Mojo. And uh, it was nice talking with you on 92.3 FM, right? 92.3 FM. You got it. All the way in California. God bless you. And uh, we'll think about David and we'll just pray on that. Well, thank you very much. 92.3 FM. I'd like to find Mojo, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Mack. We're live here with Martha Reeves. And uh, what a great night it is uh, for 92.3 and uh, for the city to have the living legend looking good in the studio, Miss Martha Reeves herself. I mean... You, you talk to some of the people that you talk to, and you know you um, you can just hear you know the love and and how you touch them you know for such a long period of time you're it still touching me them as well though. See, it's Let, let's talk about fun. that. Uh, I'm from a large family from the east side, and uh, I was born originally in Alabama. I came here when I was 11 months old, and I'd only traveled. Upon entering Motown's walls, I had never traveled except to go south every summer to visit with my grandparents until they passed away. And uh, because of Barry Gordy and his dream, I'm traveling all over the world, meeting some wonderful people, and our music gets better and better. It really does. Good morning, Vietnam didn't hurt. When Robin Williams called our name out and played Nowhere to Run, mm -hmm. Nowhere to Run with Platinum again. Uh, there's a, a backdraft that had heat wave in it. Then Mick Jagger and Dave Boyd did Dancing in the Street. I mean, we're getting all kinds of love letters. And this is a, this is the greatest feeling. I know it is. <laughs> Martha Reeves, live at 92.3 FM. Ninety two point three FM Electrify Mojo. We're live here with Martha Reeves in the studio right now. All of the times that I spent listening to that record I had no idea <laughs> that I'd be sitting in the studio interviewing you and then just watching you sing it right across uh, the turntable. You know, that's Did you what, hear Beans Bones on that baritone saxophone? Uh, oh, uh, was he jamming or what? Yes, he was. I mean, you had a funky band. I told you. I had the best tracks. Oh, you call them the Funk Brothers, huh? The Funk Brothers. That's right. <laughs> Look here, and, and all these people on the telephone, they just they just love you. Let's go back and okay. take a few calls right now. All right. And uh, when I come back, I'm going to ask you a question. And while we're taking these calls, I'll give you a little time to think about it. All right. Um, 35 years ago, uh, on the streets of the Motor City, on the east side, you were a dreamer. Yeah. You were a person who passionately believed in your dreams, and not only did you believe in the dreams, you uh, you knew those dreams could and would come true, and you pursued them vigorously until they did. Painting a picture in the city right now, there are a lot of people out there without dreams. There are a lot of people out there without hopes. There are a lot of people out there who live day to day in perpetual despair. And they have nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. They're backed up against the wall. They're backed in a corner right now. How would you suggest they come out of that corner? You said you'd give me a minute before I have to answer that. Right. Okay, so I'm going to ponder the, and my answer. We're going to take a few minutes right here and take to, talk to a few people on the phones who have been nice enough to hang on for a while. 92.3? Hello? Hello? Hi. Hey, this is uh, Flash. And my name is Flash. I'll tell you again. Martha Reeves grew up with my uncle. And I remember when she stayed over there on Baldwin and I went to St. Charles. And Martha Reeves. And we had a bet going on. Who's going to be the best? Martha Reeves or either the Supremes. Martha Reeves is still the best. She's still number one as far as I'm concerned. Bless your heart, Flash. And you know what? Yeah. You still got it. I'm still here, though. See, you as long still as I'm got here, it. Yeah, as long as I'm here in Detroit, I got it made. And I remember you because, you know, we had some girls over there that went to the same school, St. Charles, that were still following your lead. All right. And they still doing it now. I don't know what they're doing uh, 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 today. Musically. But, musically. Yeah. But 
You still have it. Well, thank you, darling. And I love you. All right, love you too, Flash. Okay, bye. Thank you, Flash. Bye-bye. 92.3? Hello? 92.3? Hello? Hello? Uh, I'd like to say hi to Martha. Hi. Okay. Hi, Martha. This is Wilma Polly from Northeastern High School. Oh, my We alma sang mater. in the choir together. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm, congratulations for your success at Motown. Thank you. You remember how nervous I was singing that aria, the Alleluia in the class? Oh, yeah, girl. You, I knew you was a hit then, and you are still a hit. Well, you, gir- you girls encouraged me because my knees were shaking. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Thank you, love, and good to talk to you again. Okay, bye-bye. God bless. We're here live with Martha Reeves, 298-7923. We're going to take a couple more calls, and we're going to come back with Martha Reeves live in Detroit. 92.3. Hey, Mo. Yeah. You know who this is, don't you? No. It's Gary. Hey, Gary, how you doing? <laughs> I'm fine. I just want to welcome your guest to the studio. Okay. Legendary Martha Reeves. Thank she you, Gary. She doesn't remember me. Uh-oh. I met you. <laughs> it was at a house with your sister, one of your sisters. Uh, it was on off of Limwood now. And I was with Eddie, Eddie Hazel. You're talking 1962 or 3. <laughs> I'll be 50 in April. Uh-huh. See there? Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm not from Detroit. You know, when I came here, I came here about 62. Uh-huh. Then I went back to Pittsburgh, and, and then when I came back here, I uh, went out with Eddie. I met Eddie Hazel. His birthday and mine on the same day, April 10th. Yeah. And I haven't caught up with him. But George Clinton and all of them, I used to go down to the Olympia and set up, uh, you know, help set up the band and everything. Didn't know what I was doing. Uh-huh. But I was just hanging with it. We used and to help each other in the olden days. Sure did. Yeah. And it was just like you said, it was, a, it was a family. Yes, it was. Because we also went over to Calvin Franklin's house and Aretha called. Uh-huh. And somebody called somebody baby sister. Do you know who, they, who, who was called baby sister? Was uh, that Aretha? Car- Carolyn is baby sister. She was? Uh-huh. Okay, because I heard it, you know, while I was there. Yeah. And I was with some of the Funkadelics there. Yeah, God but rest her soul. Yeah. But it's great to hear you again and see that you're doing so much. And, I, and I'm, I'm all for everything that goes on in the city as far as Motown. Thank you, love. Okay, you take care here. Yeah. All right. Good, good talking with you. Too. Okay. Take care, Mo. Okay, thank you, Gary. <laughs> right. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Uh, we uh, have a deep uh, love for music in our hearts. Uh, and you know, if I'm if I'm talking to you, you know who I'm talking to. Uh, it took me from uh, the ghetto. Uh, I didn't know we were poor until I started traveling, because my dad worked for the city and mom never worked. She always was there with us, and uh, we always had something to eat. We always had something to wear, but I didn't know we were poor. Uh, and the dream became a reality only because of the faith that my mom had in me as a person and uh, in life, the, the lessons she taught me in life, that you continue, that you, if you stumble, you don't fall, you, you just get back up and keep going. All through my career, she's been the one to tell me, uh, do it the best you can, try it, it'll work. And dreams do come true. Uh, it might look dark at times, and I've had some dark times, but my bright times outnumbered the, the dark times, uh, there's always been an angel somewhere about me, encouraging me. Uh, my best friends were my teachers, and I, I loved my musical classes, I loved literature, and all of it enhances my career. Uh, the things that I learned as a child, I encourage people to stay in school. If you don't get an education, you can't really expect a lot. The more information you get, the more you can use toward your goal. And, uh, I encourage everybody, if they love music, if they have any talent, to nurture it. I'm a product of a, of a lot of wonderful teachers who took their time to in, instill their knowledge and share their wisdom. And uh, that has been the key. I learned a lot from Barry Gordy. We have sat up and, and talked for hours upon hours just about life and reality, you know. And uh, I needed that as a young girl coming up, we had a chaperones who sat and talked with us and told us things about life that we couldn't have learned in any books, uh, things about uh, the, the road and 
uh, uh, learning from other artists. Motown artists helped one another. Our best friends were the were the guys on on the tours because they looked out for us and they treated us like their sisters. And I mean that that kind of love we we couldn't have bought or or we couldn't have gotten actually paid for the love that we put into making the Motown sound. But it's, but it's all been worth it every minute. And if there's someone sitting anywhere who has a dream, whether it's singing or being a wonderful electrifying type of guy like you, Mojo, or uh, a teacher, or uh, anything that you desire to be in life. Just live your dream and don't let anybody tell you that you can't make it because you can. I did, and you can do it too. Well, that was most profound. <laughs> most profound. I, I know we've been, we've kept you here all night. And, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Don't send me home. Let I, me stay. Let gonna, me stay. You can stay. <laughs> you can stay. Well, let me ask you this question. What was it like backstage doing a Motown review? Okay. I'll try to paint a picture. We'd all arrive because uh, in our first days we traveled on a bus. There would be about nine acts. There would be uh, the Marvelettes. The Contours, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Mary Wells, The Miracles, The Temptations, The Supremes, uh, Shorty Long, uh, uh, I'm trying to name everybody that was on that bus, and Choker Campbell's 12-piece band. We'd arrive, and uh, our first tour was 94 one-nighters. We didn't stay in any hotels. I think the Holiday Inn were were the only people who would let us in and uh, we only stayed on the 94 one night or two we only stayed in three holiday inns during the whole time uh, we'd arrive and the girls would take one dressing room and the guys would take the other the uh, marvelettes would get one corner the supremes would get one corner and the martha and the vandellas would get one corner and we'd fight over the mirror uh just about then one of the contours who opened the show usually because it has such dynamite uh production with Do You Love Me would come in with a pair of pants that were torn and they'd give it to one of us, namely me, and they'd say, okay, help us out because we got another show because we'd do four shows a day, some of those theaters, and we kept their pants sewed up. Uh, then Stevie would come in and uh, he played jokes on us. You know, Stevie would even come in the, in the restroom with us sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, there was nothing you could do about it. He was very playful, you know, and uh, we expected him to do something to us. Uh, if it was nothing but walk up and just knock us in the head with something. I mean, he was really, really playful and, and full of love. He never let us down. He always kept us amused. Uh, then we'd go to the edge of the stage and watch the next act. And the show would get hotter and hotter and hotter. Each act would be better than the last. And it was amazing because we would help each other. We'd uh, zip each other up, uh, fix each other's hair. Uh, and we knew that if a Motown act was on the show, the Motown act would steal the show. We programmed each other that way. We, we uh, didn't compete. We just were good together. It, mm -hmm. was a, it was wonderful. It was always great to see uh, Smokey close the show and do Mickey's Monkey and Ooh Baby Baby and just woo the women. I mean, every, everybody was satisfied with a Motown review. Everybody singing Sammy Ward would give them the blues. And uh, it was just, just a wonderful experience. Uh, I'd like to do a Motown review again real soon in Detroit, maybe at the new Fancy Five Fox Theater where we cut our baby teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that that Fox Theater, I know it. Uh, there are a lot of memories in there. Oh yeah. Uh, m most of the memories in there. Yeah. Th those memories of the first Motown review. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, the first one that you put together and yeah. you took it out there and you say like, "Well, this fly," and mm -hmm. it flew. Yeah. We yeah. did five shows, and the mothers of the groups would bring in food. We'd have a gourmet smorgasbord that, would, you know that you would die for right now. I mean, moms would bring you the goodies, like the chicken and the dressing and the, and the greens and the pies and the everything. My mom would make sure she made a, 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 a peach cobbler because Otis Williams of The Temptations craved them, and he'd always ask her, make sure you bring some peach cobbler. I mean, we had the mothers on our sides, too, and they supported us and fed us, make sure that between those four shows, their babies were nourished. I and mean, we've had some wonderful, wonderful times. <laughs> Let's, uh, before we go dancing in the street, uh, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, not, not meaning to introduce a downer, but, uh, let's, let's, um, pay tribute to some of the Motown stars who are not with us. 
Okay. Like Marvin Gaye, mm -hmm. David Ruffin, mm -hmm. Tammy Terrell. Tammy Terrell. Florence Ballard. Florence. Hubert. Hubert Johnson. Yeah. Uh, Paul Williams. Paul. David. David Ruffin. Mm hmm. Well, it just uh, even those we didn't did name, uh, you know, it wasn't something that we had a list. Uh, and I can't forget Sandra Tilly, she's a Vandella. And for uh, all of those who don't remember at this time, we'll just offer thirty seconds of silence. And if you remember some that we didn't call out, wherever you are called out, call, call their names out and. Uh, Cause we all want family here, so 30 seconds of silence. Ninety two point three FM. We're live with Martha Reeves, and uh, it is live in the studio tonight. It's live in the city right now because uh, we are touching some very raw nerves. <laughs> uh, the um, a fantastic story you were telling about the making of Dancing in the Street. Yeah. And I'd never heard it before. And. Uh, why don't you tell my audience about it? Okay, William Stevenson didn't have synthesizers at that time. Synthesizers are something new that was invented in the 80s. Uh, he stood with a car chain and a hammer and raked that car chain and that hammer to the beat. And there were no overdubs or repeating uh, uh, devices. He had to do that continually and on beat uh, all the time. And when he finished making that sound, he had a, a bloody hand, but we were satisfied that we had a rocking track. <laughs> 92.3 FM, and we had to give you a chance to hear that again. Because that little clicking sound, I mean, just to think it was made with a guy uh, beating a hammer up against a car chain. Yeah. Back in those days, the chains were a little thicker than they are now, <laughs> I think. <laughs> and and, the, and she, she tells me the guy's hand would be bleeding. Uh, it was bleeding after, after the session yeah. was over. You had to do it continually. You couldn't make a mistake because because we had limited tracks, there were no room. There was no room for overdubbing. It had to be actual. It had to be exact. So you could literally say the music of Motown is blood, sweat, sweat. and tears. Amen. <laughs> Look, Martha, I didn't mean to keep you here on that. I know you probably thought you would come in here and do thirty minutes and. <laughs> And, and then hop back in the limo and take off. We kept you here all night. I do apologize for that. That's okay, Mojo. I was sort of sad hearing the demise of Alex Haley today. And I didn't know how I was going to make it through the day because about a week ago, we rode Northwest Airlines and they did a whole uh, special thing on Alex Haley tapes. And also, also, I kept the magazine. And that magazine was laying on my bed this morning when I heard the tragic news. But then I know that he's gone on to glory. He's gone on to rest and... Uh, he's looking smiling down on us now with Kunta Kente at his side and Chicken George and all the rest of his people. So we can rejoice in knowing that we have known greatness and that our history is recorded. And we're the roots of Motown. Alex Haley is our roots. What a wonderful thing to say. But speaking of Alex right now, I, probably when they saw him, they said, Behold, yes. our great, great, great grandson. Great. Great, great grandson. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that that when I heard it today, um, I was saddened beyond disbelief because um, it's so ironic that it, it would happen during the month of February, where we are celebrating uh, Black History, and when you think about the person that has contributed the most to uh, conjuring up memories all the way back to uh, Kunta Kente yes. uh, of black history and blacks in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex Haley 
you know, stands as tall as the sun. Yes, he does. The moon and the stars. And um, I was out searching um, for roots because I, I just couldn't come on the radio tonight and and just say how sad I was to hear about Alex and and not have at least roots. I, I, I went to Sam's Jams. I went to Harmony House. Um, I called uh, record stores all over town. And, um, and uh, when I said, well, maybe uh, uh, Wendell and I have to make some sound effects up or something yeah, yeah. to get some roots on in here. Uh-huh. Uh, I called uh, Detroit Audio down on Ma- Six Mile, mm-hmm. McNichols, and they said we have one left. Mm. And and I I said well, like how long will you guys be open? They said about ten minutes, and I think I must have got there about four minutes. Hey. I was at Nine Mile in Greenville. Mm. When I got there, they showed me the album, but it, it wasn't it wasn't the root soundtrack. Mm-hmm. But it was much more than I ever could have uh, could have hoped to find. It, it was a copy of Alex Haley telling the story of Roots mm. in his own words. And um, what a treasure! In just a few minutes, we will present uh, Alex Haley uh, on ninety-two point three FM, talking to you about his roots. Uh, not us talking to you about Alex Haley, but Alex Haley talking about Alex Haley. Uh, tonight we'll do part one and we'll do uh, uh, five parts of Alex Haley through Saturday night. Uh, every night right after 11 o'clock we ran a little bit over, but uh, it was to be a, a historic night. Uh, we started off with Miles Davis, we went for Miles Davis to uh, Martha Reeves and we're going from Martha Reeves to Alex Haley and uh, I don't think that any DJ in the world could ask for uh, a more incredible uh, metamorphosis of uh, togetherness Well Mojo, you know, I listen to you all the time and you give me direction and I'm sure I can speak for a lot of the listeners that we just love you so and stay with us Well, I love you too And you you know something? Speaking about love, what is love in the words of Martha Reeves? <laughs> it's that feeling that lets you grow. It's that feeling that frees you up. It's that feeling that gives you security and makes you confident, gives you self-esteem. It's that feeling you can share and give and give and give and never think about it. That's awesome. But you've got one thing. What? It's all of those things that you mentioned. For me, it's all of those things that you mentioned, and it, it's warm. Yeah. You know? It's hot. Yeah. It makes you sweat. It's like a, a heat wave. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Martha. Let's give Martha Reeves a standing ovation. Martha Reeves. Martha Reeves.